Friday Night Racing. On Off The Ball. And they're off. Brought to you by Go Racing. Plan your day at the races at goracing.ie. All right, you're very welcome along to Friday Night Racing. Johnny Ward is with us as ever, and wherever in the world you're watching us and you're joining us, you're very welcome along. If you're uh, streaming this live at 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon on all our social channels, then well done. Thanks very much for being with us. And um, if you've got any comments for us, you can hit us up now. Uh, we're on whatever stream you're watching it. Or if you're listening to us live on the radio this evening at 8 o'clock on News Talk, then you're also very welcome. And you can text the show on 53106. Um, Derby weekend, Johnny. It's a special weekend. Yeah, special weekend, um, particularly special this year because Zakura looks so great after the redevelopment and um, it'll be interesting to hear what Chris says on this, what it's like riding there, but I would hope that the crowd comes out in force on Saturday. They're on one, on one angle, they're like absolutely gypped with the fact that Kildare are playing a big game in the championship. On the other angle, weather matters probably a lot more and the weather has been amazing the last few days like the capacity of newbridge helps a lot in that mm. the capacity is unbelievably low so uh, yeah it helps that the, that ground is such a ramshackle um disaster yeah whereas actually you know if you're if you're bringing the kids to a sports event it's much harder to get tickets for the Tyrone game than it is to get tickets for the curra yeah it's a far less friendly experience like the, the new curra is sensational it, it really is and um you know obviously the, i think the curra's success in terms of the future will be dependent on how it um, fosters links with the locality that maybe were slightly lost um but they also the, the the part that people shouldn't forget is that the, the it wasn't a racetrack really fit for purpose anymore in this day and age and if you go if you haven't been to the curra since it was redeveloped go along for the derby tomorrow and um, even go along and uh, today if you're listening to us earlier and the friday fantastic race meet again and um don't forget we're watching, you know, the, all the protagonists in the Derby are all running again in the Irish Derby. You know, we have the best, we have them running at the Curra, um, a, f a very fair racetrack. We had fantastic racing here yesterday and, um, you know, the facilities are, are really have to be seen to be believed. Okay, we'll talk to us a little bit about the, the actual race itself. Um, what's going to happen? Yeah, like uh, Chris Hazel possibly uh, advise in terms of what his tactics are or not, but it's... It's basically, um, I suppose it was an interesting um, tangent to the story in that this was going to be a seven-runner race, and um, I, this is really, really strange. And uh, quite a few people were talking about this yesterday. But um, when you declare a horse on the HRI website, it tells you um, how many entries are already, how many declarations are already in. So, so for, say for example, you were kind of humming and hawing over. Um, running your horse in a particular handicap because you thought it might be a bit competitive. But like three minutes before declaration deadline, there are like six runners instead of what you thought would be like 17. So you're saying to yourself, well, oh, like, it's going to be, it. yeah, be a small field here. So it's cool that you kind of know how many. Now, it's a bit like having having um, that bet with the tote on the off where the price looks huge and then everyone piles in and then the price collapses. So like there, you'll get a, a load of these late entries and all of a sudden it changes. But anyway, there were going to be seven declared for the Irish Derby and purportedly, anyway, John Magner told Aidan O'Brien, he's like, oh, that's not, uh, that's not great for, for punters um, each way. Uh, let's declare a, a long shot to bring it up to eight. And we have three eight-way places and... Um, that apparently was was the situation in the fact that uh, they declared a horse rated um, 87 Il Paradiso, and as such we have eight runners and, and three each way places. So it's just it was a strange one. I it, it wasn't something you'd hear very often where John Magner was worried about each way punters. Yeah, but I, I think in fairness everybody wants the the industry to survive and thrive, right? That they like um, it's an unusual industry in that everybody has an interest in it succeeding and understands that for that to happen you need crossover appeal. Oh, oh totally, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, this, this race is a race that has maybe struggled a bit because Aidan O'Brien has had huge dominance in it in recent years. And the, the narrative here is that, and Chris, will, um, Chris is a great guest because he's riding Mad Moon and essentially everyone who hasn't had a bet in the race wants Mad Moon to win this because Kevin Prendergast to win an Irish Derby um, at this stage of his life advancing towards his 90s at this stage, mid-80s going on 90s. Um, Chris Hayes as well to have a ride like this, a horse who ran such a blinder at, at Epsom. I mean, he, he, he won the battle for second place, beaten a half a length with a slew of horses behind him. But, you know, Aidan... Aidan O'Brien's kind of legacy isn't really going to be affected by whether he wins one more Irish Derby or not. Kevin Hindergast most certainly will. 
Yeah. Um, what is it about Kevin Prendergast that is allowing him to compete at this level at this stage of his career? Probably giving up cigarettes when he was 50, being honest. Do you know, <laughs> he was, uh, you know, every time I hear, every time I think of on his deathbed and all that, I think of Del Boy trying to convince Rodney that, you know, everything is as it is because um, our mother said this on her deathbed and that's why we're living the life we are. But Kevin, I remember him telling me how his dad, Darky, the legendary trainer, told him before he died that you better give up the cigarettes and um, he was probably a chain smoker at that time. So I think we can safely say if, if Kevin hadn't taken his advice, I'm not sure he'd be training the second favourite for the Irish Derby at um, 86 years of age, 87 this month, I think. Um, so he's... Gets up early in the morning, loves the spot of fishing, loves outdoor life, um, still loves a couple of pints, but um, give up the cigarettes. And I think probably if you're out there listening now, um, look at Kevin Prendergast in terms of... It's never the, too late. It's never too late. It's And it is never genuinely never too late because you can, you can stop the damage um, at, or at least limit it. And uh, what a story it is, you know. Like, what, where do you have a sportsman competing? I, I had a photo online of John Kiley riding out um, the other day. John Kiley riding these proper big jumping horses in his early 80s, riding out. Now, I don't think Kevin's riding out, but uh, he could... Um, he could maybe do a flying dismount off Mad Moon if he wins his Derby, you know. Um, I just want to tell you about this before we uh, get into talking to Chris Hayes. Uh, we're going to have ownership, oh, this is off the ball, we're going to have ownership of a horse. We're, we're taking the plunge temporarily. It's running in Leopardstown on Thursday the 11th of July, which is the evening meeting, so um, it's about a week and a half away. We're going to go out and um, do our stable visit next week to Ada McGuinness. Um, so the horse's name is Ozzy Valentine, and he's currently owned in partnership by Gary Devlin and Joseph McCrory. So thanks to the lads for letting us take him for a day. Um, they get to keep the prize money, though, so it's all right. It's not, there's no Rocket Gibraltar situation here. <laughs> uh, we're going to be filming next week, and we're going to go and see the actual race itself. So we'll bring you the report of that on um, the 12th, which is obviously the day after. But we do need some help in coming up with a syndicate name. We need a syndicate name. So if anybody has any good ideas, because we've got no good ideas. Syndicate names should be good, right? Shouldn't they? This is like, do we get a chance to hoof, hoof the ball? Yeah, I, I think off the wall office has proven itself fairly adept at uh, these situations. Bad puns coming up with bad puns, yeah. Well, like off the wall, off the brawl, yeah. off the brawl, <laughs> off the bridle. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think you'll come up with something. Off the bridle is a sore point. <laughs> it's been banned from the office, apparently. Has it? Yeah. Why? I don't know. It's just um... if we were to have um, another a second racing show on this new. 24-7 off the ball. It wouldn't be a bad name, I would have thought. Off the bridle. Off the bridle, yeah. You want to see you, you're lobbying for off the bridle. Am I? Are you? That's what Maybe it is. Maybe I am. I'm lobbying for off the bridle. I think it'd be, I think it'd be a good show, but um, the... the uh, I wanted to call it my lovely horse. Yeah, yeah. It's like, a, it works, but it's, it's very obvious. Maybe it's not obvious anymore. Maybe there's a generation of people who don't have a clue what my lovely horse is. Well, yeah, we're not among that generation, which is quite scary, I suppose. But um, no, I mean, I think in terms of syndicate name, it's a good idea, though. Like, and Ada was. How do you think we're in the same generation there, Johnny? It's, it's uh, nice of you to butter me up like that on the Friday. Yeah, I'm probably closer to your generation than people who don't remember Father Ted. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. Um, you stuck with us. It's a uh, good man to get involved, though, Ada McGuinness. Obviously, we had him on the show, and uh, I think the fact is, well, he's. He's um, he's based in Dublin, like so. He's he's a, a trainer that if you ever got involved with, you can like, like Damon English and go up and um, you know see your horse or whatever. I was I was talking to a guy uh, yesterday who's he's, he said his daughter has gone really really mad into horses, like and she's I think nine or ten, and he lives like in the sort of Balbriggan area. So I was like, well, sooner or later now you'll be ringing Damon English and saying like, would you mind if she rode out or whatever, and who knows what might happen. Come here, um, Sabrasi won again. I think after you let him go. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's correct. has got one word WhatsApp from Kevin Caban going, Sabras. And I was like, I didn't even check. I assume, he, I assume it was a winner. Yeah, I, I did a, a piece on the, the beauty of, of claimers last Friday, a piece to Forty2.ie, whatever, but um, the beauty of claimers is also the horrible nature of claimers in that you can let a horse go and then he just wins the following week. One of seven grand, one about seven grand. Um, and you sort of say, like, uh, you know, like... You can always say these things before anything actually happens because you can be like, oh, the best of luck to the new owners. I wish them all the best. But then <laughs> Not obviously, that much luck. <laughs> uh, didn't actually mean win a race four days later. 
Had you entered him in that race? Was it already on the end? No, of he, was, he, was, he had to be entered the following morning. Right. So it was actually Noel Kelly, the trainer. First of all, he should be lauded for claiming the horse. Um, I don't think anyone else put in a claim. So like, he was the only one thinking this was worthwhile. Claimed the horse for four grand and then had the wherewithal to enter him the very next morning, which he needed to for race in Ballon Robe, which he won. And the owner returned seven grand minus deductions. So the owner is already in profit. It's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good, and in fairness to the horse, he's been a, a little star for very small money. But that's how claimers work, and uh, it's, it's it was it was very much mixed feelings watching him on in other someone else's colours. Yeah, and and then the mixed feelings obviously of him actually winning the race because you're like, well, if I'd held on, in theory, I'd have I'd have uh, won a few bob. But anyway, it is what it is. Do you have any runners in the minute? Just one horse out who's he's coming back into training shortly and needs heavy ground. Right, so yeah. nothing, nothing over the summer then. No. Unless, is there heavy ground ever over the summer, even at Galway? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, like, um, uh, you, you frequently get heavy ground on places like Sligo during the summer, but right. I don't know, has Ireland's climate just completely changed now, where we just, it doesn't really rain much anymore? It's rained a lot in the last month. It has, all right, in fair, even in Dublin it has rained a bit, but um, they were, I mean, the weather last night in, in Ballymena, it was, like, it was actually uncomfortable sitting down in the stand at 8 o'clock in the evening, it was that hot. Um, and then you read of obviously all the, the, the heat wave in, in Europe and all that, but um, in any event, hopefully there'll be heavy ground this winter. Okay, let's, uh, let's get back to um, our guest and uh, start talking about the Curra Festival this weekend. Um, what else are you looking out for before we get Chris on the line there for the rest of the weekend? Yeah, it's, it's, it's great, it's great racing, obviously. Um, the the, the, the Curra's experiments a bit with the timing of... Uh, of the races in that the derby is 5:20 now on a on a Saturday, and the the meeting obviously the Friday meeting is, is a little bit earlier. But we also have the railway stakes as well, which is sort of the, the precursor to the derby. Uh, Arizona, who won a Royal Ascot, he'd be one of the um, kind of star acts. But Siskin from Geraldine's stable as well, a very interesting runner who swerved Royal Ascot. The railway stakes looks like an absolute cracker of a race, and um, you know you certainly won't be let down if you go to the Curra uh, in terms of the quality of the racing this weekend. So the railway takes the race before the derby yeah that's um, 440 6 four long race for two year olds and uh, uh, 130 grand up, up for grabs but there are plenty of Jim Bulger represented as well obviously Aiden is strongly represented but uh, it's going to be a cracker yeah what do you like or what, what, why is it such a cracker what? well if you, I suppose you even look at um, some of the horses that have won the race Master Craftsman, I think I was there when he won at George Washington going back in the day, Antonius Pius, Rocket Gibraltar that you mentioned, um, some proper, proper good horses, and it, it'll be another cracking race. Uh, it's a sprint, six rounds. Yeah, if you're looking at these two-year-olds who are going to be you know, probable stars of the future, um, and if you're, I suppose, if you're listening to this at three o'clock uh, on Friday, there, there's, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing Albina uh, run for Jessica Harrington in the 4.15 today, the, the early stud stakes. She looks a very, very promising filly, but the, it's just proper racing over the three days, really, Ger. Was Arizona the horse that Aidan O'Brien told us about when he was on with us? Um, or was it American Pharaoh? That was actually the American Pharaoh horse. So I don't know if Arizona came up, but um, he 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 did the job nicely. Roy Lascott, he's he's um, having won easily at the Curra and will will enjoy coming back to the Curra if declared. Was it Monarch of Egypt? Is but that, that was Monarch of Egypt. Yeah. Okay. So he likes Monarch of Egypt, but I, I don't see prices in this race yet. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, we're just waiting on uh, on declarations um, as as we speak. So the the field will probably whittle a bit, but. Um, It'll be interesting what he declares. And has Monarch of Egypt lived up to the expectation? It's very early days with him, like so. I'm not sure if he's going to declare him here as right. well. But in fairness, he wasn't wrong. He, he did the job very nicely. These horses. Um, so this is over six furlongs. They, we're talking still about the um, railway stakes. Um, because they're six furlongs of two-year-olds, does that mean they're? Do any of them end up being horses that run a mile and, and a mile and a bit? Yeah, they did. They, they all is that the plan for all of them? Yeah, you're, I suppose your average six furlong two year old at this stage would would probably get a mile. And um, the mile and a half horses, you'd imagine that it might be a struggle for them, but there aren't that many sort of good races open to like seven furlongs is as far as you'd go as a two year old at this stage of the season. And um, they, they do open races over a mile and a little bit further later on. There's even a mile and two race in the Newmarket later in the campaign. But is that just because they're not ready for it? Yeah, they're not ready for it. And uh, they stay better with age as well. And obviously, as they get bigger and they get stronger, like they are babies as two year olds that they, you wouldn't run a two year old against a, a four year old, for example, and be like 
won uh, an under 16 kind of against a senior um, so it doesn't really happen but they, like these horses should most of them will definitely get a mile and um, the, you never hear of two year olds running bumpers really in National Hunt do you? No bumpers would be um, in Ireland they're all all four year old and up and So what happens if you've got a National Hunt horse between the age of two and four you're just sitting there waiting for a training at home? Yeah um, obviously some of them come off the flat but um, they're just they'd just be far too slow to do anything and you just uh, they call them store horses just wait for them to run as a four year old basically right. um, in, in a bumper yeah and um, they wouldn't have the speed for this or they shouldn't have anyway. Okay and so then you do hear some horses who don't make it as uh, flat horses who end up on the national hunt later yeah, on. Often they're just too big, um, and uh, but generally you'd know by your pedigree where you're going to go anyway. When they're too big, uh, well, you'd know from the day that the horse is born on pedigree what it should be like, and yeah. most of the time it is. Obviously, sometimes then um, the horse is like a little bit slower slower to come to hand and just simply slower, and um, so he might have a flat pedigree, but you're like, well, we'll wait for bumpers with him. Okay. All right, we're just having some trouble getting Chris on the line there, so we may as well uh, go back and talk about the rest of the uh, the Derby field and see exactly what is going to be putting it up to them. So uh, we talked a little bit about what the expectation for the type of race this might be. Um, is there is there uh, a guaranteed pacemaker in a race like this? Or a, a uh, yeah, because like you, you sort of think now Will Paradiso going in uh, rated eighty seven. As I said, he he's certainly not going to be winning the race. There was an interesting kind of change in um, Coolmore's sort of strategy in races a few years ago where they figured that um, they'd run sort of no-hopers in races and they'd, they'd make the pace. Aidan O'Brien's big thing is that you know, races are run at a reasonable or even pace that they're, it cuts out excuses and that's why um, I, I believe one of the reasons that um, when when it was being redeveloped, the Derby stayed at the Curra was, I think people were cognizant of the fact that the Curra is an extremely fair track and it's rare enough that you've looked and run in problems. And it's, that's not the case at Leopardstown. Leopardstown is, is tighter and you can get lost coming into the straight. Epsom is a crazy track. So like the irony being that like the most important race of the year is run on one of the zaniest tracks going is kind of um, completely inconsistent with the Curra, which is a fair track. So the, the, the best horse normally wins. So Aidan O'Brien's other thing is get, get an even gallop. I'd imagine Neil Paradis will go out in front. You know, if you looked at the race at Epsom, Anthony Van Dyke, um, I remember we, we were actually here on the day, Anthony Van Dyke sort of came up, um, he came up the rail and he kind of had his own path in the race and then you had this bunch of horses in the middle, including Mad Mood, obviously, and Broom, who were basically just split by a nostril at the line and then you had Norway in behind who's going to be running again. Rakan is quite interesting for Dermot Well, he won at uh, Leopardstown in a small field last time, won very readily and he's a little bit from the left field in that he, he didn't go down the Derby sort of trials route. Um, he was behind Broome earlier in the season but he's by see the stars so when he stepped up to a mile and a half it certainly suited him um, at Leopardstown last time. He's quite interesting, I, I could see him run a reasonable race. Just as a matter of interest, why wouldn't you, if you had somebody, if you had a horse that's like reasonable and can stay the course, why wouldn't you declare for the Derby? Well, you see, like, so there's prize money back to eighth. 15 grand for coming eighth, which is exactly what it costs to run in the race as 1% of the um, one and a half million prize money. Um, but unfortunately, Jerry, like, say if you did have, um, say if you did have a horse running in this, that was quite decent. You don't really know what he's going to run in. You're almost certain he's not going to win. Um, the, the best you can do is come seventh or eighth in terms of getting your money back. So, for argument's sake, you'd imagine Il Paradiso is going to probably, if he goes out in front, he'll do well not to finish last. But even then, if you finish seventh, you have to beat the other horses who you're probably rated inferior to. And it's still, it could be a costly enough game at 15 grand. Now, if, if it came up as a four-runner field, and just going back looking at when See the Stars won, or rather when um, Australia won the race, I think there were only, there were only like five horses in it. Uh, Australia beat four horses home, but like Coolmore having what? What did Coolmore run in the Derby? Six or seven horses. So you know you're probably going to come up against that. And most most of these connections, they just won't have them entered in the first place unless they thought they were very good. All right, I'm delighted to say that we've got uh, Chris Hayes on the line. Chris, good morning to you. How you doing? Good morning, lad. How are you getting on today? 
Uh, good, good. Very busy, but we're getting on well. Tell us a little bit about what um, today and tomorrow are actually like for you, because um, you know there's a, a huge amount of stories and talk and, and chatter about Mad Moon and Kevin Prendergast generally, and you're the man responsible for actually riding the horse tomorrow. Um, can you put it, put all that to one side, or is it just hard because people are chatting to you about it the whole time? Uh, look, I, I, I've been very busy. Yesterday, I was in in uh, Kevin's, and I sat in Mad Moon, and I was riding work around the curry yesterday morning, and down in Tipperary today, I'm in Stacks, I'm in between lots here now, so um, there isn't much time to think, you just kind of keep going with it at the minute, which I suppose is a good thing. Are you looking forward to it? Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, yeah, for the last couple of weeks, you're just seeing as you, how, how much he's improved, how well he is, um, and the closer you're getting to the race, then you're kind of wondering how many aids are going to run, how many outsiders are going to run, so look, all of that is, is done and dusted now, we, we know the final field, we know where we're drawn, so just have to make up a plan. I mean, I'm very interested in that, Chris, because um, making up a plan in this race, the way the way Epsom worked out, if if that race is run again, do you do the exact same thing? Do do the Bally Doyle lads do the exact same thing, or would they would they have maybe done things differently, or is it a race you think actually was a fair result, and maybe the Coral suit differently, or what's your visualization of what might happen? Well, look, um, you don't need me to tell you Aidan O'Brien is a genius and a master tactician, so I, he, he, he could he could have any sort of plan laid out for tomorrow. Um, but as regards myself, um, initially I went with, with, with plan A um, was to jump and sit in the middle of a mess at Epsom. And he just, cantering down, he just got a little bit um, fresh in my hands, cantering around Tottenham Corner up. Um, to the mile, mile and a quarter start. So I just said to myself, I better do right by the horse and ride him cold. Um, in my opinion, he was the fastest horse in the race, so I was going to ride him accordingly then. Um, he got into a lovely rhythm. I couldn't have been happier on, until uh, the little stumble, and it, it just forced my momentum a little bit. He, uh, he got a little bit lit up and got going sooner than I wanted to. Um, but look, hopefully, like... It's a far stiffer test. It's a far more galloping track than Epsom, so he should be he should be fine on on the home turf. As well as that, uh, you know, you're riding a horse that you're obviously not guaranteed to get home. That, like the attitude he showed to finish second, considering the madness of Epsom and the track and all that, and coming from the Guineas, it must give you a confidence in terms of him getting into a battle. Anyway, ah, uh, yeah. Look, uh, as regards his stamina, I think he proved that he does stay in Epsom because, like. To be honest with you, everything, I was writing him as if he was going to stay. That was my initial plan. And then I went down and I said, well, if he's keen with me, he'll never stay. So I rode him the way I rode him. And like he was racing from from Tottenham Corner right to the line um, and never gave up second. And I, I think if Jamie came to me upside like the other ones had, he, he could have found another little bit to out-battle him. He, he's very tenacious. He's very genuine, and he wants to please you. So, uh, as regards battling and things like that, I've no concerns. Um, to be honest with you, I've no concerns about the trip either because I thought he put that to bed. Um, I thought he put that to bed in Epsom. So, look, look, I'm going in full of confidence. It's just we need a little bit of luck on the day. That's all. We spoke about it here before you came on about Aidan declaring Il Paradiso, um, essentially to make it a three-place race, but. Is the expectation that like the likes of Il Paradiso will go off hard in front because he is a long shot and you'll kind of be playing a bit of cat and mouse in behind? Um, to be honest with you, with that kind of rate, um, he, he's a nice pedigree and I think it, it, it was great for them to, to do that for the e way players or punters or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'd imagine that he'll just drop in and pick up the pieces, I would think. Right. Um like sovereign, um, he, he made the the running in in Epsom. I, I look, he, he's made the running in all his starts this year. It'd be very much a shock if he didn't go and do it. Um, it's just kind of trying to figure out what the rest will do. But look, my main concern is is, is myself. And I'm, I've the plum drawing one and. On the rail, it's the shortest way around. But I presume if I if I try to go the shortest way around, I, I would meet a bit of traffic. They, they have every t- every um, entitlement to be afraid of him, Jar, as well in terms of what his tactics are. You know? Yeah, well, I was I was going to say that. Um, you know, obviously, it, it's interesting you said there. You thought he was the fastest horse in the race. That's something you're saying to us today, having been up against this field. Do you still feel he's the fastest horse in the race? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. I like, um, I'm trying not to repeat myself, but like that stumble um, coming into Tattenham Corner, like, and actually, while I'm on it, um, he didn't actually clip heels because I'd say if I clipped heels, I'd have been plastered all over Tottenham Corner. I think one of the uh, reporters said that he clipped heels, but at that kind of speed, it, it was a stumble just over the road crossing. He um, lost a little bit of balance, pitched out in his head, and he got racing. So if you're racing for three furlongs, like his fastest time was from the three to the one of the whole field. Mm. So, like, he has to be, to me, he's the fastest. It's just up to me to make sure I, I, I use it accordingly. Do you know what I mean? And I can get a clear run. And Like, he's a savage turn of foot. If you look from where he was when he stumbled to get the gap in between Ryan and Frankie and then to be battling it out from a furlong and a half down after doing all that. Do you know, he's, he's, he's a very willing attitude. And when you're riding him, you don't, from a jockey's point of view, at the start of the year, you were kind of saying, geez, he'll never get a mile and a half. He'll never get a mile and a half. But he does. So he's just a very good horse in the fact that he has pace and he stays. Well, so what's your immediate sensation after a race like that then when you, you feel, obviously you get the times afterwards, but you feel how fast he is and you must be thinking, Jesus, but for that slip, we'd have had the Derby winner. Oh, yeah, but, like, my, my initial reaction after that was um, heartbreak. I was disgusted. I was sick. Um, it, it, it was uncontrollable. Everything was going according to script. I couldn't have been happier following Jamie Heffernan. Um, I said Anthony Van Dyke, in my opinion, was the one to beat because he was the farm two-year-old, hardened. He'd been there, done that. Like I said, happy and travelling away behind him. And in a split second, it went from, yeah, grand now, I'll just ease him out here and go forward a little bit. Then he pitched, and all of a sudden I'm racing. And as soon as you hit the line, you're always, I just, I can't really say on air what, what my exact words were, but uh, you're heartbroken. But look, if we can rectify it on um, on Saturday, hopefully it'll it'll mend the heart of you. I, it, it, like, it seems like it's such a random occurrence. You, you talk about the controllables, that's like an uncontrollable. Do you know what caused the, the stumble or, or even like... It's just how mad the track is really, Chris, is it? Yeah, look, it's a very demanding track. Like, uh, <clears throat> I've done a lot of um, homework on it before. I um, I obviously rode in it um, and I was thankful that I got a ride from Mr. Well in the Oaks the day before. I'd spoken to, to Mick Canan and Pat Mullen and watched numerous videos, but I, I watched um, something on Aidan and Joseph on, on how special and unique the Derby was. And like they said, it, it demands everything from the, the horse. Like everything has to go right mentally. They have to have the right temperament. They have to right, have the right balance. And it, just everything didn't go right for us. Nine, nine out of the ten teams went right. And just there's there's actually um, a, a foot crossing where they'll, they'll they'll walk from one side of the track to the other just before Tattenham Corner, and it was he just lost his balance at the far side of that. Now whether he didn't see it until I eased him out and he pitched out over it, or you know like they're the things that were playing in my mind. If I had stayed behind Jamie going into the bend and then eased him out. Would it have made a difference? I'll never know because I had eased him out. He went three strides and then pitched. Do you know? Yeah. Um, but I just think it was one of those things. It was the nature of the track. Um, we were unfortunate it happened, but it, it, it's done now. We were half a length off, off winning this and hopefully we'll be at least half a length the, the right side of it this time. Well, that's the thing. Like, um, you know, whatever about the number of defeats that you guys suffer as jockeys, there's always an opportunity to, to rectify it and no better opportunity than tomorrow afternoon at um, 20 past five. I do want to ask you about the other element of this story. It's not just um, the, the revenge mission that you guys are on, but there's also this whole... Um, story about uh, a guy in his mid to late eighties, and I don't want to do him a disservice. Uh, who is as hale and hearty as they come? Who's you know still uh, out there fighting the bit out with trainers literally half his age, and uh, some trainers who are young enough to be his uh, grandkids or great grandchildren in some instances. What's that like to be around? What's that energy like to be around? 
Yeah, look, I, I, I've been with, with, with the boss since, I think I walked into the yard um, November 2004, I think. 2003, sorry, November 2003. I walked down the yard coming out of a race. And from the first morning I shook his hand until today, he's always been very good to me, very loyal. Um, he, even as an apprentice, he never looks outside the yard. If, you, if you're in there and you're grasping and you're walking, he, he's very good to you. And um, I think back in 2013 when I, I became his first jockey and to have Lacalina win, the emotion took over me because I, I always saw him a, a, as a real strong role model and, you know, he, he he taught me everything. And for me to, to repay him with a group on was brilliant. And then Oz had um, in 2016. But I think the fact that, like, after what's after happening in Epsom, if, if, we, if we could do this, it would mean the world. Because, as I said, everything he's done for me, I wouldn't be where I am without him. And the uh, tutelage he's given me throughout the years... Um, now look at it. We've often had cross words, but I think when you've an association that long, you're bound to have that kind of thing. But it'll mean the world to me anyway. I'm it'll mean the world to him. He's been honest as well. You often hear like, oh, we've we've known each other 20 years and we've never had a crossword. Often a husband and wife and you know, well, that's not true anyway for, <laughs> for one thing. But Chris is an honest man, but uh, he's... Um there's no one like him, really, you know, in terms of um, he's incomparable, Chris, really, just what his zest for life and just um, the crack you get out of him as well. Like, he always has that kind of glint in his eye. Oh, yeah, look, he, he, um, he gets up real early in the morning. He has his dogs, his horses, um, golf, shooting, fishing. You know, he's very active. Um, I, I, I don't consider him 86 or 87 or whatever he is, but just consider him a boss and um, it's just nice that we've we've landed on, on this kind of horse but like he, he says it as it is you know like when I won the guineas for him like I, I, I've been quoted as saying it I shook his hand on the walk in and said well done he turned around and he just said to me you went too soon <laughs> you know he, 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 he says what he thinks and when he says it it's done you know that kind of way but um win, lose, or draw, if he has a comment to make on, on something he rode, and it might even be one of his horses, he could say, we'll say, even this year now, if I rode one of Mr. Wells or rode one of Fozzie's, he, he, he'd say to me, what were you doing on this? Why didn't you do that? You know, he's, he's very sharp. You're not going to pull the wool over his eyes anyway. I think it's safe to say he's not going to go too soon on Mad Moon anyway. Are you open to that, Chris? Or like, are you are you kind of... Because, um, I mean, most of us would be a little bit defensive. I've just won the race. What do you mean I went too soon? But how, how do you take that kind of stuff? Ah, uh, look, I just started laughing, to be honest with you, because we, we were after winning the class. Um, I was after working him since... I actually was in Dubai that winter, and I flew home especially to ride him. Um, and I'd won a few races and the thing was he, he just said to me take your time he didn't give me any other instructions he just said take your time and when I saw the the, the chance to kind of him Frankie in on the day I, I, I kind of took it and kicked on now it was sooner than ideal but like I won a couple of lengths and I was never in any doubt but I just laughed it off and he, he said it to me once or twice since you went too soon you went too soon but it was laughing afterwards but he just let you know because he, he always he's always getting trying to get you to ride the perfect race, you know, um, and win, lose or draw tomorrow. If I make a mistake, he he will pull me up on it. Now I could win ten lengths and he'd still pull me up on it. Do you know what I mean? I, I guess uh, the concern if you back Mad Moon is that you can't quantify what Galileo horses trained by Aiden could do in terms of improvement from one race to the next. So I suppose he'd nearly have to have improved from Epsom. But do you think he's even is he at least in the same form as he was? I I think he has improved. Yeah. Um, I definitely think he has improved. It's the clearest run we've got with him as well. Um, as regards preparation has gone to the letter, um, I think I, I'm definitely couldn't be happier with him. The boss couldn't be happier with him. Just everything has gone as you'd want it or as you'd have hoped for it. Um, he's bucking and squealing. You know, there's loads of life in him. Um, and he, I think he'd have to be open to the improvement because... I, I know he, ran mile and half, like. he, he was never in the race. Yeah. You know? so, um, so the first time he got into a real battle, and I think he thrived off it. So I think we could see, 
you'll definitely see a, a better version of him anyway tomorrow. You okay. can't oversee it as well. Do you know, a horse that's been trained all his life to run over a mile or seven furlongs or whatever, and then the, the first stab at a mile and a half is in the Epsom Derby. Like, he's almost nearly a blank canvas at a mile and a half. Oh, de- definitely. Um, and to, again, like, yeah, that took some some um, courage and to, 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 to go. Like, I remember flying home that day from Newmark, and he said to me, I went up to the box, and he asked me where I wanted to check having to ask the boss where, where did he think the next one was, and they, they both agreed on Ipsum. Like, you could have said, oh, I'll bring him back for a derby trial in Leopardstown, or I'll bring him here, or I'll bring him there, but the boss and, and Jay Camden like it was a it was a very ballsy call in my opinion to go straight from the mile up to the mile and a half and have no concerns you know yeah for sure Chris best of luck it was a big ballsy call doing that and it's a big ballsy call tomorrow to um, get him ready for it uh, I think it's one of those stories that the whole Irish sporting public will be absolutely thrilled for you so no pressure enjoy it listen thanks lads best well, of luck Chris, Chris. Cheers, thanks. Uh, Chris Hayes there riding out this morning um, en route to the Curra where he's obviously in action as we uh, speak at the moment if you're uh, watching this streaming live or indeed uh, has been in action uh, this afternoon if you're listening to this on the radio. Friday Night Racing is of course as always brought to you by GoRacing.ie if you're heading to the Curra if you're heading anywhere else ever and you want to know what's going on then get on to GoRacing.ie and you get all your details for you there. Now the Tote Irish Injured Jockeys Charity Fund remains €5,329 after the Michael Callahan trained I Am Superman failed to land a blow in the Jersey Stakes at Royal Ascot last Saturday. As we've been talking about, massive weekend for <coughs> pardon me, Irish racing. The Dubai Duty Free Irish Derby takes centre stage at the Curra tomorrow. First, third and fourth from Epsom will again lock horns in what promises to be a fantastic race. Across the English Channel, the big race of the weekend will come from Newcastle, who hosts their big race of the year. It's the Northumberland Plate. Willie Mullins, it looks like being one of the um, having likely favourite there, Stratum in that. So, uh, remember, you can enjoy the Tote versus SP best price guarantee in all Irish racing this weekend. Check out thetote.com for details. What is our bet? Um, just before that, actually, I haven't done this, mentioned Willie Mullins. He did have a setback um, since we were last on. Uh, I've been obviously in contact with him, and uh, they're they're very happy with the progress he's been making. And uh, he, I don't think he's given a proper interview uh, since, but um, he'll obviously reveal uh, that it, it was. I only actually heard of it on on the um, Royal Ascot show last Saturday. Um, so he's had a, a, an operation of some description, and um, obviously we all wish him the best. Um, I was on to him and Patrick, and things seem to be going very well. So um, it's it's uh, it's it's a relief for everyone in racing that that Willie's making a recovery, and hopefully this will be a great time for a winner. Um, American, the American Pharaoh horse looks like um, Monarch of Egypt, like he might be the main one in that race. We've had the declarations come through. Um, he's running against Siskin, as I mentioned, five runners in that race. I'm going to go with Siskin as the nap in the that's in the railway stakes at 4:40 at the Courage Our Lines horse. I think he's a he's a bright bright prospect. Having said that, I, I, you'd have to respect Monarch of Egypt. Okay, so and have you got prices in that yet? No, I think uh, Siskin and Monarch of Egypt will probably be joint favourites or something like that. Okay, so yeah. short price? Uh, and it'd be 7 to 4 anyway, I'd say. Yeah, okay, yeah. so you're going for Siskin. Siskin in the 440 under Colin Keane for Gerlines. And that is a win. Win, yeah. Okay, that's uh, number 10, Siskin at 440. Uh, the Curra, um, Great to see the positivity of, of uh, Chris. Yeah, it's great, well. isn't it? Yeah. Kevin is. Um, He's a very positive trainer in terms of his horse's chance. Sometimes I think he might be, uh, he might wear the kind of the blue tinted glasses or whatever. Um, and who 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 would begrudge him really? It, it's worked out for him. If yeah. I can be eighty six and eighty seven slash, I mean, it's good that he's like uh, one of those Hollywood starlets from the thirties and forties. That he's got no age. No yeah. one knows what age she is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and Kevin has. I don't think Kevin could be accused of liposuction or, or any anything like that. But. Um, Chris is probably a bit more maybe grounded in terms of the horse's chance as a general rule and Chris is quite quite bullish there I would have thought Sounds alright yeah. yeah and um, Johnny good stuff without being biased like I think we kind of all hope he wins yeah no it would be great as a one off and as a thing that captures the imagination so that's Mad Moon at uh, 5.20 in the Derby tomorrow as I, as I said earlier uh, Friday Night Racing brought to you by our partners at GoRacing.ie um, that is your Friday Night Racing in the books for this week. We'll be back next week at the same time, 3 o'clock on all of our social channels and on offtheball.com, of course, which is the best place to get it. And then at 8 o'clock on Friday night on News Talk as well. Good luck.
Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball and they're off. brought to you by Go Racing plan your day at the races at goracing.ie